writers, agents, and publishers, for the first time since the Gutenberg Press, find themselves lost in a maze of mystery as technology alters the shape of the publishing industry. Searching for Answers is a group of writers throwing pop culture, writing, and publishing into a crucible of clarity, passion, and humor. This group is the Right Pack. Welcome back to Right Pack Radio. This is your host and producer, David Allen Lucas, president of Winding Trails Media, president of St. Louis Writers Guild, currently working on some interesting projects, um, including a graphic novel that will be started up again in September. And actually, I'll be co-writing that, not, or co-authoring that, not actually the main writer. Um, also, to come to St. Charles, Missouri in on September 16th, 2017, if you haven't been in the area, for a... Pre- actually, Bradley, when it gets to Brad's turn to talk, I'll let him talk more on it, <laughs> if he knows more about it. But anyway, we are, once again, crossing swords about writing the fight scene, and we're going to be um, make, having a presentation at a small... Um, writing group basically aimed at um, women's writing and making women strong. Something like that. Something along those lines. I've read it and I'm just, I need to read back to my papers. So Look on, to our websites for more. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. My website Soon. hopefully will be, will be back up by the time this airs. <laughs> In the future. We'll yes. Yes. yes, exactly. <laughs> so, and on that note, let me turn this over to my lovely co-host, who has got a fabulous article about how a certain writer affected her, so I'll let her talk. Well, um, my name is Kathleen Kayembe. I write speculative fiction and an assortment of other fun things. I write paranormal romance under the pen name Kaseka and Vita, and under my own name. I have a personal essay up on okafrica.com right now. It is to help promote the anthology Luminescent Threads in which it appears. The anthology is uh, about the effect of Octavia Butler on people's lives, and that's what the essay is about, and I hope you will check it out. And then I hope you will go back in time to an earlier podcast episode where we discuss Octavia Butler, because I love that woman so much. And I believe that podcast occurred in February of 2016. You can find it on Blog Talk Radio, iTunes, TuneIn, or YouTube. Sounds about right. I am also a freelance editor and putting together an Amherst Writers and Artists workshop. So if you're local to St. Louis, contact me if you are interested. Also with us today... Uh, My name is Janelle H.N. I write things. (laughs) Every time... I I always stop at that. I'm sorry. I write things, including um, science fiction and fantasy. Yes, be confident. (laughs) And also with us is our... Resident Leonardo da Vinci. I was waiting to see what what tag you were going to give me. Mm-hmm. Oh, actually, I was trying to think of a female artist that would be of that caliber. I well, couldn't think you, of a name. So. Thank you for not picking Frida. Okay, I don't even know who Frida is. So. I love her, though. She's <laughs> great, but she has a mighty... She's great. Out. There's a great... <laughs> <mighty> <laughs> There's okay. nothing wrong with that. <laughs> so anyway... I would prefer not to have a mighty unibrow. Um, my name is Jennifer Stolzer. I'm a children's book author and illustrator. This is airing in early September? This is airing in mid-October, I mid-October, believe. October. I mean, mid- mid-August. Okay. Oh, I was like, we have recorded a lot of this in mid-October. My goodness. When are we doing so our So is this Halloween before episode? or after the eclipse? And uh, before, actually, I'm not positive. Uh, this is before it's Argon, still, too. It's still before mm-hmm. Argon, and it's still before the Pirate Party, which was yes. important, because I have to pimp the Pirate Party whenever I can. So the Old Man and the Pirate Princess, which I illustrated, is premiering on September the 9th at 10 a.m. at Main Street Books in St. Charles, written by the local lovely Jessica Matthews, and she'll have uh, pirate prizes and pirate events, come dress as a pirate and bring your pirate children, uh, pirate treasure hunts, and uh, and color-coded M&Ms, and signatures, and all sorts of things. Pirate, 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 pirate. <laughs> yes. And to answer the question, just in case everyone out there in the universe wants to know, this is being recorded July 30th and will air on August 27th. Well, so probably. After the eclipse. So that's after the eclipse. After the eclipse. Well, it welcome, to, 
Everyone who was here in the middle of the country for the total eclipse, the next time we'll have one will be over 400 years from now and we'll all be dead. Unless we're in jars. I was going to say, technology's changing. <laughs> it's not going to change fast enough to put me in a jar. It's called cryogenics, come on! I still have yet to take the Highlander challenge, too. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, if you fail the Highlander challenge, you're... Yeah, yeah, it's not a good it's challenge. Like, it's a Daffy Duck thing. It's a great trick, but you can only you do, do it once. once. <laughs> uh, I am Brad R. Cook. I am the author of many a thing, kind of. Uh, some things. Uh, there are steampunk things. No. Yeah, we can't talk uh, about your things, everyone. Yes. <laughs> now, I'm the author of the Iron Chronicles, which is uh, Iron Horseman, Iron Zulu, and Iron Lotus. And uh, newly released, uh, check out Doomed Flight of the Majestic, which is kind of diesel punk and kind of a throwback to Hollywood's golden age. Uh, it's a fun little jaunt in the sky where they're trying to make a movie before the plane goes down. Ooh, ooh. Anyway, dun, dun. fun stuff. Check it all out at brightarcook.com. Also with us today is... I'm Melanie Lucas, and I'm currently trying to figure out um, how someone would perform magic in my particular universe. I know, Jim, you know, you can do magic with strings or mm-hmm. with paintbrushes, but, you know, yeah. how does it work in my universe? So. Yeah, she's having her little fun and problems. Yeah. You don't want to do it, but... I turn it over now again to our Madame of Murder, who will be in Scotland, I understand. Absolutely. When this is airing. It's currently in Scotland. Currently in Scotland. She is, she is, she's, she's doing the looping aspect here. <laughs> Hi, I'm Vic, uh, Fedora Amos, and I write Victorian Who Done It's like Jack the Ripper in St. Louis and Mayhem at Buffalo Bill's Wild West. I'm also president of Greater St. Louis Sisters in Crime, and we just recently celebrated Sister in Crime's 30th anniversary. And we have been supporting women crime writers for 30 years, and that's only the first 30. Lots more to come. One more thing, I want to give a shout out to the Book It Ladies in St. Charles. I'm going to see you on September the 7th. Excellent. And quick question, that is Sisters in Crime itself is 30 years yes. old? Yes. Okay. Sisters in Crime, the national organization is wow. 30 years old. Yay. And also with us today is... Uh, my name is George Soroy. I'm an author of science fiction for the young adult reader. Uh, both my um, both my novel Excelsior and the five-part serial from Parts Unknown are all available on ebook, uh, with paperbacks coming very shortly. Um, the part two of the Excelsior Journey, Ever Upward, is currently in editing. I'm also an audiobook narrator with, um, with three books under my belt as of right now. Uh, first book is Argentum by Debbie Mamber Kupfer. Then the children's book, Rumpel Pimple, and the children's book, The Golden Rule. Um, I'm also the proud president of the Missouri Writers Guild. I am going to be at PenCon uh, September 29th and 30th. I'm going to be at Archon October 1st. And as of January 20th, 2018... I'm going to be a father. Whoa! 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 Nice! Congratulations. What's the date? January 20th, 2018. Congratulations! Yes. Nice. Yes. Of us listening, just he yeah. literally just dropped this. We don't have no idea until oh, just right. now. Oh he, my god! He has the big news he wanted to share. Wanted to share. We couldn't do it until he confirmed it. Now I know. Uh huh. Yeah. <laughs> wow. wow! Yes. Congratulations! Thank you. Congrats. And somehow our remote member is going to have to top that. <laughs> Ryan. Yeah, there's no topping. <laughs> Great answer. But uh, I'll just say my two cents. Um, my name is Ryan Freeman. I write fantasy. Um, I also do freelance marketing and uh, editing for new writers and small businesses. Some of my books include Rain Spell, uh, The Grey Isle Tale, and The Trombonus of Must. And um, yeah, give me a, uh, a call or an email if you uh, need some help with what you're working on. Excellent. And I forgot to mention something earlier. It's nothing at all like George's announcement. It <laughs> completely pales in comparison. But I finally got my voiceover demo done this week, recorded. I'm waiting for it to be delivered. So by the time my website up is up, by the time you guys hear this episode, you'll also be able to go out and listen to the commercial demo on my voiceover. That is, you know, come buy a car, oh, hey, this restaurant's introducing stuff, so forth. Your normal radio commercials. 
There will be other demos coming out soon, including anime. So with that, though, let's talk about the topic for today, which is we're going to talk about both Robert Jordan and creating a universe that feels real. So who wants to... Uh, uh, I'm going to turn this immediately over to Fangirl, who is <laughs> all but dancing in her seat in anxiety to talk oh, about geez. Robert Jordan. Y'all don't understand how nervous I have been just because it's it's Robert Jordan is a big deal for me. <laughs> it, it, it's a it's a big thing. Um, like since I was prepubescent, preteen, like made me want to write a big deal kind of thing. So the fact that we're actually talking about him this episode, I'm geeking out just a little bit. Mm -hmm. Just tiny, tiny bit. Well, sure. Yeah, tell us how, how you're so Robert inspirational. <laughs> um, <laughs> Who is this person? Some, somebody else take that one. <laughs> I don't have my phone, so I can't look at Wikipedia. And it sucks. Okay, who? But I can tell you he's one of the pillars of fantasy fiction. Mm -hmm. uh, and when I say that, uh, the Wheel of Time series is one of those gigantic epics that never ends, and you don't want it to end, and when you got to the end... You didn't believe you were at the end. Mm -hmm. And then luckily it wasn't the end. <laughs> uh, and there was a little bit more. No yeah. spoilers because I haven't gotten there yet. Uh, I'm, I'm not spoiling anything, I promise. <laughs> I will um, say... But yeah, so it's one of those gigantic, epic fantasy worlds that no one has yet tried to turn into a movie, thank God. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I don't think anyone can do it right yet. That's why I, I say thank God. No, I, I totally agree. <laughs> there are some epic fantasy worlds out there that I adore and cannot wait until they hit the screen. Lotor was the first of them and the greatest of them, but there are many, and The Wheel of Time is, is one of them. I heard that who does own the rights did like a, a really short video just to retain the rights, but it has very little to do with the actual story. Actually, what had happened was... <laughs> um, <laughs> I like it. Um, actually, if I remember correctly, they did a small, a small, really crappy, low-budget movie. So that was yeah. supposed to encompass the pro, um, prologue. Tying in the last week. Mm -hmm. um, and they s did not do a very good job, is what I've heard. I did not see mm -hmm. it because it literally... I think it aired in the middle of the night on sci-fi one day and then oh disappeared and then Robert yeah. Jordan's wife got involved and it kind of snowballed into a thing wow. <laughs> that's the problem with those ash can types of uh, types of projects is that they're basically made just to re you know retain the rights to something yeah. without yeah. any sort of regards of quality uh, you can just, you know, look at any fan of either Hellraiser or the Fantastic Four. Hey, the Fantastic Four is good. Yes, yeah, so the Fantastic Four <laughs> yes, is quite, is quite let's good. Let's go back to yeah, the that is, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but it's still better than Fan Four Stick. But, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, the, uh, but, yeah, just, well, you know, like, I'll just bring it back over to the, to the poor Hellraiser fans who had to put up with Hellraiser Revelations <laughs> to know that, uh, you know, just to endure the same sort of you know, crap, just so that Miramax can hold on to the rights. Mm -hmm. Just real quick, and before we all jump in, as you want to say, we, this is technically the 10th anniversary, if you will, of uh, Robert Jordan passing away. He yes. passed away September 16th, 2007. He is best known for Wheel of Time. Yes, I have Wikipedia in front of me. He, <laughs> he, he did other stuff, too. Um, yes, he did. Yes. He was one of several writers who wrote who wrote the original Conan the Barbarian novels. Ah. Mm -hmm. um, so which still remain yeah. highly acclaimed today. He also wrote historical fiction under the pseudonym uh, Reagan O'Neill, a western under Jackson O'Reilly, and <laughs> dance criticism as Cheng Lung. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, right. had, I had to include that. It's like, wow. Well, well, like dance it. criticism. I like it. Like I, it. Yeah. I have a he also, like back in the day I'd be a huge fan of that. And not only that, but I'm also kind of laughing that he chose a pen name of a Chinese sound name. Oh, it's a Chinese sounding pen name. I was like, okay. That's and then he also ghost wrote an international thriller um, that is still believed to, be, to have been written by someone else, and they don't say who. Um, Robert Jordan itself is, his, is a pen name. His real name was James Oliver Rigney. I hope I pronounced that right. If I didn't, don't throw him tomatoes. <laughs> Junior. And with that, Punt it over to my friend over there, Kathleen. So, I 
have a feeling that we're discussing Robert Jordan and creating a universe that feels real mm -hmm. and that Chanel is such a fangirl because he managed to create a universe that felt so real that Chanel was inspired to write herself. Mm -hmm. Please discuss yes. what made his universe so great and explain it to someone who's never read it like me. Oh my goodness. Why? It never ends. Why it should I bother ends. reading him? Because I told you to. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and what's the next reason? All right, listeners, we're not here first. Chanel has told you yep. to read the Wheel of Time series. Yep, Chanel's book But on. what specifically inspired you about his universe? Oh, my goodness. It, 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 it just seemed so far-reaching. It seemed like every time that I thought I knew everything that there was to know about this world, he would come up with something new and, like, a new people, a new way of, like, societal interactions, a new political scheme. And I, it just blew my mind that this world just kept unfolding and unfolding and unfolding. And I remember thinking, not just, I want to write, but I want to write like that. I want to write something that seems like it's, I could just somehow take my brain out of my body, shift it over to like an astral plane somewhere, and this would exist. These people would be here. This world would exist. And that is, I think, one of the things that he was amazing at, was just creating a world that just didn't quit. So, and I've got a question for you. Like, mm. Oh, I'll let you go next. I was before. just gonna ask for more information because I can't make a good decision without all the information possible, <laughs> Chanel. I can't decide if I'm gonna open this book and read it if I don't know what sort of world building did he do? How, what was the scope of this world? Like, and was Chanel? it interstellar? I hear it's epic fantasy. How epic was the map situation? And as part of that, I'm going to ask this question because it's falling right into the same thing. I just don't want to repeat. It sounds like it, like the universe he created was pretty much extremely layered, almost like my favorite term I seem to be using regarding writing is like an onion. So back to Kathleen's question, is this true? Oh, jeez. Yes, yes like absolutely, onion. because... One of the things that I noticed that he did is that he never really told you everything up front, which, you know, good writing, you shouldn't. Um, of course, someone's going to find a way to subvert that. But whatever. Good writing, you shouldn't show everything or tell everything up front. Mm -hmm. And he would treat you like you were in the world. And he would bring something up, but bring it up almost casually. And he, But he would be like, okay, this Trolloc here. And I'm like, what's a Trolloc? And, and he would keep going. And you would start learning a little bit more about Trollocs, but it was very organic feeling. So it didn't feel like you were getting this info dump of, of Trolloc lore and what everything they've been involved in since the beginning of the breaking of the world, etc. Um, also, there is a whole mytho, like not even mythos. It is a help me out here. What would you call that? Because it's literally heroes from thousands of years ago that it's are still mythology. He has an yeah, like, mythology. Yeah, yeah, like mythos, Tolkien, yeah. he has an entire world mythology. Yes. That spans thousands and thousands of years. Yes. And you see these things from thousands of years actually coming back and making like sort of waves in what is currently currently story time going on. So you get a sense of past, present and what could possibly happen in the future yeah. if XYZ doesn't happen. Well, one of the things I would add is that one of the things that I find brilliant, and many have done this, but he did it brilliantly, is that weaving effect of, because there are what, 10 novels um, in the I Wheel think, of Time series? Is he, 19? Um, or 19? No, no, it's not 14, 19. 14. 14 and a prequel. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah 14 and a prequel. So yeah, there are a ton of them. Uh, and the point being is that um, a lot of them are oddly connected. And it doesn't just mean that the next book is connected to the book that came previous to it. Uh, you might be reading a book that connects to the third book in the series, but you're on book Good. like 13. Yes. You know, or you're, you know, like there's a whole series of things that connect and there's a whole, you know, as you are saying, the onion layering effect. Um, but it's creating that immersive world and creating it so much to the point where it does feel real. And I would say that's actually, because if you look at all the big worlds, you know, even uh, like Westeros or... Uh, Anne McCaffrey's, you know, world, mm -hmm. or um, the Dragonlance Chronicles, you know, Kryn, mm -hmm. uh, and that whole world, they, they are so immersive, they're so big, there's so much mythology, there's so much history, that it does feel like it's a parallel universe out there, and if I could only find the right way to, like, cut through this one, right. and go into the next dimension, I could go live there. Uh, and I think that's one of the things that brings it, and then also just sheer content, you have to understand, Robert Jordan was writing in the age of 
of high epic series mm -hmm. where these series just went on and on and on and you just kept reading and reading and it just kept taking up more and more of your bookshelf yes. <laughs> until this shelf was Robert Jordan and this shelf was all my Dragon uh, Dungeons and Dragons novels and this shelf was like dedicated to you know others you know so it, it's one of those kinds of series. You also have to include on your bookshelf the notes that you have to take to remember yes. Robert Jordan. These this does require an extensive like note taking. Mm -hmm. it, it's a thing. We've done it before. My friends and I have notebooks of notes for this series. Of course, wow. now you have Wikipedia to look it up. Too. No, no, do it yourself. You gotta do it yourself. There you go. Sometimes you just can't do it online. <laughs> Kathleen and then Fedora. Something that I remember you saying from our previous episode on prologues, uh -huh. um, I believe it was about this book, where the prologue you read for one of the books mm -hmm. takes place like a thousand years in the past about somebody, and you see in real time, you experience with this person what happens, and it's tragic. And then you fast forward, and the story begins, and this person is passed into legend, and people don't have that first-hand experience of the tragedy that it was. They, like, time has fudged all the details. And so what you're getting in this story um, is what people think happened instead of what actually happened. And I love the idea of stories that can do that with time, that will allow time to change what people believe about an event, can allow details to vanish in the ether over time. And a canticle fully... A Canticle for Leibowitz does this really well. Um, it's a story set in our world in three segments. The first is basically right after nuclear fallout has happened and people are trying to rebuild. And then it's a few hundred years later in the same town, but um, names have fudged with the way vernacular changes and details about the bombing that happened that made the world a post post-apocalyptic have shifted and the truth is getting lost and technology is getting lost and then you fast forward again and you see the same sort of thing happening so it felt real to me in a way watching the language change watching the society change watching time change so much just the passing of time be adhered to in a realistic fashion so one of the things i liked about what you said last week was that this prologue and then the book itself did the same thing with time. It treated time realistically. Mm -hmm. And the way people perceived characters changed over time in a realistic way. Yes, absolutely. Fedora, Ryan, George. Fedora. Perhaps the most wonderful thing about reading is that we can go to a different world we can go to any kind of different world. It could be a science fiction or a fantasy. It could be historical. It would mm -hmm. take us back to ancient Rome. It could take us anywhere, and we can live there without any of the real problems, but only observing the problems, though we might feel a faster heartbeat now and then. We can live them there not for just an hour or two, as in the movies, we can live there for the whole time it takes us to read the book. And if God bless the writer with more books, then we can live there longer and enjoy ourselves and escape from whatever realities are holding us back. That is the most wonderful thing about books, in my estimation. Right? Um, two things. One, um, one of the things I remember, because I read it in college, and... Um, I really enjoyed how big it was, how big the scope of Robert Jordan's world was. Like, I get bored in small worlds. I get bored when it's like, it's kind of predictable, but it wasn't predictable. There's so much going on and I, I ate it like candy. Um, so I, I love that. Um, the, the one thing that I, um, I wasn't a big fan of, I know, oh my gosh. One thing I wasn't a, a big fan of with Robert Jordan was how he wrote his, his female characters. Yes, Lord. Thank you, thank you for bringing that up. I'm going to shut up. Go ahead. And I want to see what you guys saw. <laughs> Can I just say, for those who cannot look at all of us right now, when um, when Ryan brought up that he had a he had a, a, a beef with Robert Jordan, <laughs> Chanel's face became 
horrified and ready to fight. And then when Brian brought up what it was he objected to, she was like, oh, thank you. She was like a lady in church being like, yes, Lauren. <laughs> How'd that go again? I don't have an assassin coming for me now. So. No, no, no. Um, you had a, a beef with the one thing that was acceptable. Apparently. Yes, that was one of the, like, even fan, uh, fan, approved beefs with the series is the way so, that he did. Ryan, what was your question there that you were kicking us off to? I've got George waiting. How do we feel oh, about this? Oh, I, I just wanted, wanted to see what, what the, the group that has read Robert Jordan thought of how he wrote his female characters. Okay. Uh, George, is your internet connected or no? Uh, well, mine was dovetailing off of what Kathleen had said earlier. Okay. Uh, let's go George and then we'll answer this question. Okay. Uh, just really quickly, I know that um, um, what Kathleen was talking about before regarding storytelling Throughout the uh, throughout the generations and everything of the world that you are creating, uh, we got to see that. I know that uh, I know that it's you know usually the norm to kind of kick around the Star Wars prequels, but there is one element that I really uh, that I really appreciated, and that was the story that Palpatine told Anakin of Darth Plagueis the Wise. Oh yeah, um, because what that to me is al- is always something that I feel is a real strong element of world building is when your characters have stories that they have carried on from generation to generation just like what you were talking about with um uh with the books so you know that is something that i feel is a really great tool to use for authors because we are you know we're creating a world mm-hmm. by you know by telling the stories of all these different characters so why not have our characters tell stories as well you know, just kind of brings an extra layer into it, just like you said, like an onion. Mm-hmm. Jeffrey? I think that actually dovetails perfectly into what I wanted to say about Brian's question, mm-hmm. and one of the things that I wanted to say about how you create a universe that feels real. So, um, if you're going to make a universe that feels real to an audience that is in our time and place in the universe, you're going to need to create characters that your audience can believe are real. Um, that means, you know, the men can't just be the kind that you might be able to find in everyday life in bits and pieces. Like you might, you can't just do that with male characters though. And it sounds like Jordan didn't do that with female characters in the way he did it with male characters, Mm. which is something that will take me out of a story if I'm like, ah, not another romance subplot. That is not how women think. But... You can clearly still get a lot of fans, even if you do, you fall off the wagon in some particular way. Um, In this case, it sounds like the world that he created outside of female characters was enough to make fans want to come back. Yeah, I don't know the issue with his female characters. Can someone unpack that one for me? So the the, the consensus that I've um, been seeing is that he is very, there's a type of female character one type of female character and then the rest is kind of like an ensemble so you have your strong female character and forgive my language she's usually an icy bitch and <laughs> you and then the rest of the um the rest of the women kind of all like flutter around like a gaggle of geese and then you have another strong female cold-blooded bitch character gaggle of geese around her strong cold-blooded bitch character gaggle geese around her so it seems like all of his women characters seem to be that you can only have like a important part to play in the story if you are a cold-blooded bitch and are trying to subvert your femininity so it sounds like <laughs> sounds like he based his entire female yes. cast if you will on middle school Mm. <laughs> <laughs> just, just put it out there. Go ahead, Ryan. <laughs> well, I was just gonna say, like, and like, what really turned me off, and like, because I was like just devouring it, because I was just like, okay, I'm gonna read this. I didn't realize how many books there were. <laughs> was, uh, That's how they get you. Oops. I, I was like, so many of the main, the main female characters like hate men. Like, I don't. It's probably not exactly true, you know. But like, they're always like, oh, they're idiots. Oh, they can't do anything yes. right, you know. And they even have like. Like, uh, the magic system is set up, well, only with some good reasons, to, to like, exclude men. Um, and I, I remember one time I was, I was just, I was dating my, I was going to be my wife, and I was like, I asked Steph, Steph, do you really think this way? <laughs> you, know, 
you know, and I figured, well, she's a girl. She, she can tell me, right? Um, All depends if you want to say yes or no, no. to the later question of, do you want to get married? Go ahead. <laughs> well, no, that was another one. That, that would have been funny, but... Um, and she's like, well, no, of course I don't think everything to do is stupid. I mean, you know, sometimes, sure, but, like, I felt like it happened again and again and again with a lot of different characters, female characters in his world. And one of my, my big rules for world building with my, my, my own epic fantasy is that it has to ring true to me. And, and I liked Robert Jordan's story, don't get me wrong, but it always snagged me on the main female characters because they, they, I feel like they weren't true to life. Okay, really quick, Brad, Kathleen, and then I want to bring us back to the entire creating universe. Okay. A real, a, a uh, real quick, universe. just to kind of jump on this. Uh, so, yeah, he did have issues with his female characters, and this is not to sound apologetic or uh, in any way, but uh, back when he started writing the Wheel of Time series, there were only a few standard, acceptable fantasy female tropes. And he chose the more bombastic so, one, less slutty damsel, so you're more saying slutty bitch. He wasn't trying to be disrespectful, he was just a little lazy. And yes, <laughs> <laughs> and, and I can see it. coming from a time that was a little less PC, you know, a little bit less enlightened, a little less woke. So, <laughs> it's just... One of the, I like, it's, it's weird to say that because it's, you know, I don't want to defend the guy at all because I don't necessarily agree with it. I think you should write a much more rounded characters and you're going to write much more in depth. But seeing, like, the tropes he had available in the fantasy universe, uh, he chose one that was powerful yet. But the idea is, why did he choose tropes exactly. at all? Yeah. It was a time he could get away with that and exactly. not have everyone call him on his lazy writing. Yep. Yeah, that's really true. And I'm, <laughs> yeah. sitting here, I'm sitting here cringing on the grounds of like, yeah, that was playing to steer this in a different direction. Yeah, no, I knew by the look on Brad's face that's what's going to happen. Go ahead. <laughs> Chanel, then Kathleen, and then I do want to steer this. <laughs> um, so what I will say is um, the gender dynamics in general in this in the series are a bit skewed. Yeah. And if if anyone is trying to uh, thinking of going into this series, that is something that you may want to um, consider if that's a hot button issue for you, or even if it's not. Mm -hmm. um, because there is a lot of, well, men think women are like this, and women think men are like this, and they tend to act and judge and speak accordingly. So a lot of 1950s. Yes, like the women all want, are all judging the men for this reason. The men are all saying that the women are all gossiping about them and need to go back to the kitchen, etc. And not in so many words. But um, there are a lot of... Uh, the groups, they're, they're almost like prejudiced towards each other. But when the stuff goes down and they have to rally up to defend XYZ, everyone is on the same page. Yeah. But on any other day, the women's council is over here saying that the men's council is a bunch of fools and the men's council is over there saying the women are a bunch of gossips. Well, that sounds like part of his world building too then. Not it, having read the book, I have no idea. Well, it is. It really is. Um, so, But it is something that is there. Okay, before we get... I, I think we're getting stuck in an area which is <laughs> fine, but... <laughs> I, I, if you're going to take us to where I think we, where I want to go, fantastic, go for it. Because I've got lots of people suddenly jumping on. And I'm like, no, we need to focus back on how creating a realistic universe. I've enjoyed the conversation. That conversation is okay. great, but we need to get to the topic. Uh, was this going to be more of the same? I'm not sure. Why don't I? Now we're all confused and a little worried. Yeah, no, it's. <laughs> yeah, so uh, I was actually bringing up Ursula Le Guin's Earthsea that um, ah, society that. is also very part of society is also very gender defined roles. She handled it a little bit differently, and it's a woman writer, so she handled it differently. But it was also very much men were less so in the movie, but. Disregard the movie. Disregard yeah. the movie. But, no movie. Yeah, there's no movie. It doesn't exist. It doesn't exist. But, that whitewash thing. But, the idea, but if you read the entire series of Earthsea, she actually makes a point, this is one of her points, but world building wise, I think it's an important component of, gender roles is an important component of, Earth, of world building. Yes. And how different 
the sexes yes. deal with each other. I'm glad you brought up gender roles because what I had wanted to go back to is actually how you create a realistic society. Thank you. Um, and um, it needs to be something that based on the reader's experience or the viewer's experience, they can believe is a, a realistic way people would interact with one another. Um, Octavia E. Butler, who uh, that essay that I have on OK Africa is uh, about, has the best um, societal and group dynamics I have ever seen a writer do. Read Octavia Butler if you ever want to see how someone can create a world where the interactions between people are realistic, even when you really, really, really wish she would change some stuff and make everybody happy and wonderful and fairy tale esque. So, the way people, the way one person relates to another, needs to be realistic. The way people relate to each other in a group is generally different than the way they interact with each other one on one. And each time you take a step back, like widen the circle of interaction you need to pay attention to how it works in our society and take notes because, okay, I'm gonna step off that soapbox. Please discuss because <laughs> government and religion all tie into this group dynamics, gender roles, and who uses gender roles to their advantage, who subverts them. This all ties into how you create realistic worlds with multiple societies, especially for an, an epic fantasy. And uh, yeah. And How I think, do people do that? I think this also ties into historical, believe it or not, science, science fiction, obviously, with that, but mystery and so forth. I'm going to kick it over to first Fedora, then Brad, then Jen, and then Brian. It seems to me that there are three things that a person has to do, a writer has to do, in order to create a world that other people want to inhabit, at least temporarily. Mm -hmm. And the first one is what we've all been talking about, and that is relatable characters in some fashion or another. Even if they make you angry, they're relatable. <laughs> you may not like them, but they're still something you can understand. The second is, I think, to take some facet of normal life and then supply a twist to it. Take Brad, for example. He writes steampunk in which he takes legitimate history and then gives it a cute little twist that makes it fun to read. So it has to be something that is interesting to read and third that it has to be have enough detail that people can find a surprise here and there as you talked about earlier that you can discover something in historicals for example that the author has turned over some little bit of history that you ought to know but don't. Like a woman invented windshield wipers. Did you know that? No. <laughs> That's a kind of detail that I like to put in historical fiction. And that makes it real. It makes it very concrete because we can see where we've been. Mm -hmm. And so I think details, relatable characters, and something ordinary but with a twist will help make a world an inviting place that people want to go there to live with you for a while. Slide in and I'm turning it over to Brad. Slide in there, that mythology we talked about with Robert Jordan and all the others that falls into that, the stories they've got to tell. Go ahead. Uh, one of the things uh, that I love in about these giant worlds uh, is all this layering that goes into them from the, the creation on up. Uh, one of the things that I love about uh, Game of Thrones is that no character is one-sided. Every character has their own motivation, their public motivation, their private motivation, their slightly darker, naughtier motivation, um, and then an overwhelming sense of whatever is guiding them or pushing them forward and all of that. And out of that, you get this really convoluted sense of, you know, who's with whom, who's not with whom, who likes who, all of that switches up. And then you kill like a third of everybody. You, know, mm -hmm. you, know, you, you, you start mixing up this mixing bowl and it works. One of the things he does brilliantly, and this is uh, where I would go, is don't make this stuff up. Uh, mm -hmm. Go into history, which is what George R. R. Martin does, 
and just mine it for wonderful stories, i.e. that a woman created, you know, the windshield wiper, and use that, and, you know, use that to build up your world. Use it to give it that sense of realism. Use it to invoke a sense of familiarity on things that we know. But then, as you said, with My World and Steampunk, you've got to twist it a little bit to show something new, which uh, in most of these worlds is stuff like magic and their dragons and how are they different from other, you know, realms, magic and dragons, uh, you know, and by doing all of this and kind of getting all of this into your head, you create something that's different than everyone else has created and yet grounded in a sense of a world we all know. Um, one of the things I love about the Dragonlance Chronicles, one of the things I loved about uh, the Wheel of Time, one of the things I loved about uh, some of the other really Anne McCaffrey series, um, they all felt like they could have been some historical version of Earth. Even, uh, you know, the Lord of the Rings feels like it might have been, like there might have been this age of magic. And by grounding it in that sense of it, I get to kind of hope and dream, and maybe it was there, maybe it wasn't. But uh, by mining from other sources, uh, you don't have to create all this stuff yourself. Can I make a note about that, though? Okay. If you're taking inspiration from our world, which I think is a wonderful, wonderful thing to do, don't just lift everything and oh, deposit no. it oh, in God, your world. Yes. No. Please no. No, like, no. For one thing, that's going to break the internal logic of your world because the reason things happen in our society the way they do is because of what's going on in the wider world. Like, from basic things like why there are so many buttons on Victorian clothing, they all have a reason. And if you put them all in your world without thinking about those details, the reasons behind things, people are going to be like, but why? So, take from our world, but mix and match. Yeah, Don't use lift. inspiration. Yes, inspiration. Jen, Ryan, George. Well, that's a, that's a great segue into what I was wanting to add to the conversation, which was... Um, Cautioning everyone inventing their own worlds or writing in history or anything like that uh, to remember that uh, your, your protagonist is not an island. That they were raised in this place. And all their friends were raised in this place and their villains were raised in this place. And at one time they were a child absorbing the world around them and drawing conclusions about how it worked and what they wanted based on that. So when you look at your world, if you're in a world that uh, has a, a more archaic gender politic thing going on, you're going to raise a man and a woman with that expected to be the norm. And they'll respond to their world and to the things that are happening in it based on those conclusions that there's no reason why they wouldn't think that was true. As opposed to, uh, I'm sure everyone has... Um, experienced the uh, enlightened female historical mm. if you read any <laughs> historical oh. romances or novels Victorian where she's, romances yeah, especially if she's always ahead of her time and she don't need no man and, and she's I, probably I a poet <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's the you know there you, you did write her because she also wears pants oh yeah, yeah pants. I totally wrote it um, and that's, that is a trope in itself, although, yes. uh, although Genevieve is one of my favorite characters. <laughs> um, the point is that, that, uh, do something interesting with it. Um, but that, that character, like, when you transplant a YA protagonist into a historical novel, it feels jarring. Just it like if you transplant a YA, and I'm saying YA because I'm thinking traditional high school girl or traditional high school boy, from, into a fantasy novel where there's never been high school. <laughs> Some things might translate, but you have to think about where that person came from. They didn't spring out just as they are when the book starts on page one. They existed before the book. And the world existed before the book. And the world came from somewhere. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's more people living in that world than just your protagonist and their friends. They're going to go to a town where people live and things happen. Uh, stuff that's unrelated to them, that they don't actually need to get involved in. <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, maybe they wander across a baker shop on the corner, use that as a, just as a landmark while they're navigating town. They don't actually have to go in the baker shop and meet the baker, but it might be nice to add a detail about how 
Uh, there was a sign out for uh, apple pies because apples were in season. Mm -hmm. Like just little stuff to make the world feel more fleshed out and real because it is, it is supposed to be an immersive, full experience as if you were there. So that's my that's my addition. Well, as you said, the baker's there. Yeah, the baker He's there lives every there. Day, yeah. yeah, he grew up there too. Exactly. He has ideas and thoughts. He might have a different story? political view than your main character, but you'll never know because he's not important. <laughs> <laughs> Ryan, George, Kathleen. Okay, so uh, when I when I and I'm still setting it up really, uh, my my own epic fantasy world. Um, minor spoilers, so hear us if you are the twelve people that read my stuff. Um, <laughs> I love um, ancient mythology. It's, it's probably one of my primary loves even before writing. Um, and so when I started reading a, a diverse kind of swath of myths, I started getting questions about band mythology, how there's always these, these relating themes. And so what I did with my twist is I thought, okay, well, what if all these things are being repeated because there's running, there's, there are giants, there are dwarves, there are elves, there are gods. Um, and they all come into play in one world. And so that helped me actually chase real questions I have about our own mythology, about our own history as, as a people. Like, I'm part Irish, so that means that the Celtic myths and legends that I read in Peter Beresford Ellis' book, which is awesome, mm -hmm. um, like, I have a stake in that somehow. And so I, I need to find out what happens to the God stories because they they are connected to my own people and so it's not just writing to entertain it's, it's writing to answer questions questions that i have um and i feel like a good world that you build is going to answer real questions george <laughs> to add on to what jen was talking about before um it's it's always good to you know to drop like you know some definite uh you know references and everything into your story if you're not just up chucking a bunch of references for the sake of putting in references. I enjoyed Ready Player One for the most part, but at the same time, man, you know, like it's like I get it, Ernest. You you grew up in the '80s. You have like all of these different references. It gets to, it's almost Family Guy esque the way that he just like just drops them, just like Back to the Future. Isn't it funny? <laughs> you have to be able to use those references, the information that you have to the benefit of your story. One of the most fun parts that um, that I got to do when writing from Parts Unknown, uh, there's a scene that I was that I was working on for part five, uh, since the um, the last half of, of the of the story is one big like best of five uh, tournament that goes on. And it got to match number four and I was thinking like, all right, do I do I make this just like a regular? Um, do I make this like a regular wrestling match, or and I reached out to my wrestling fan friends like, or do I do something that evokes what is known in wrestling lore as the finger poke of doom? I'm not going to get into details. Just go ahead and Google it. It's there. But as soon as I dropped that question, everyone that was on, on that site just said finger poke of doom, finger poke of doom, and I figured out a great way to incorporate it so that way it wasn't just dropping a reference for the sake of dropping a reference. It was actually, like, meaningful to the story. So if you're going to do those sort of things, make sure that they tie into your story and it's not just an upchucking of references just because you have all this crap in your head. Let's, uh, <laughs> let's come back to this topic when we eventually talk about comedy writing. <laughs> because a reference is not a joke. Yes. Just yeah. like a reference is not a, a story, uh, an item list, you know. Mm -hmm. It's just be you just because you can make one doesn't mean that you always should. Yes. Mm -hmm. Um so I don't think we have come yet to the kind of questions you need to ask yourself when world building that mostly the key question you ask yourself is what if? Um for fantasy especially, um but for sci-fi as well, what if? And so Orson Scott Card in his book How to Write Science Fiction and Fantasy talks about an exercise he does with students where he'll start off asking them, what is the price of magic? And they'll say, uh, well, sacrifice, blood sacrifice is the price of magic. So he'll say, okay, magic is done by blood sacrifice. What does that mean for this world? How does that affect 
commerce, how does that affect um, children, really? Because is some sacrifice more powerful than others? And you have to extrapolate ask yourself questions, ask and then answer them, and then ask yourself the questions that would follow from that. Um, there's a book called Einstein's Dreams by Alan Lightman that I absolutely adore. And the book is basically a giant exercise in asking, what if time were like this? So we, we perceive linear time, but what if time were like a circle? Or what if time had a fixed point where all time stopped and then everywhere spreading out from that time goes faster and faster and faster how would that change the world how would that change the way people interact who would want to be in that fixed point and who would want to be as far from that as possible what would happen if nobody died like those are those are one simple twist on the way life is now but it has so many it has such a huge ripple effect it changes everything about the world so an exercise that might be fun for you to do is just take the world that we live in and change one thing. What if this were true? How would that affect the way parents relate to children? How would that affect how money works? Um, Shadowrun actually does a great job of this. Shadowrun is a role-playing game, uh, a tabletop role-playing game, and also a video game series that Chanel exposed me to. <sighs> and what it does is it starts with one question. It's said in our world, but what if in like 2020, magic started seeping into our world? What would it change? Like, I immediately ask, how does magic work? What type of magic? Good questions. Other good questions. <laughs> Other good questions. Are people going to become magical? And if so, how? People start being born as orcs. How do people react when babies are suddenly not human? You love them just as much. <laughs> <laughs> not everyone's going to do that because this is a human society. So what is that going to look like? And it goes on. And that's just one world. I think it might be good to talk about worlds that did a good job. Ryan? Um, one of the things I do to kind of like refresh my brain to get, get a world building going is um, I'm a big fan of Skyrim, like I've mentioned before, and Elder Scrolls stuff. And so I have the, um, the soundtrack. So when I'm driving around town, I'll put it in my car, and I'll listen to it. And I'll drive around, not really, you know, looking where I'm going too much. And, um, mm -hmm. I'll, well, you know, enough to drive safely, but... Um, Everyone watch out for him in Hannibal, Missouri. Seriously. Right. <laughs> Don't walk where he drives. And I will gun you down. No. Mm -hmm. um, I get points. But back. I like I like to imagine, I like to reimagine Hannibal, where I live, as like a village. And with the music going... Um, it, it helps me do that. And so it's no longer I just just a modern river town. Beautiful. It's it's a river town in some fantasy world, you know? And so like these are no longer like stores just regular store owners or people who are around about. These are people with quests and adventures and stories. Um and so my point is one of the big things I found that's helped me again and again and again is music is when I'm world building, mm -hmm. I find not only generally the right kind of music, but what kind of world am I building? If I'm doing a Celtic inspired world, well, I should check out some Celtic music. You know, if I'm doing this kind, I should check out this music. And so anything to really get your imagination. I'm like Ryan as far as music, music helps me solidify what's going on in the world and so forth of what I'm writing. Um, just want to throw out, and I say this almost cringingly because I am afraid of how DC, the DC Cinematic Universe is going to eventually pan out. I'm hoping, praying, that Wonder Woman was a sign that's going to go really well. Um, but it depends on your director, man. Yeah, it all depends. And, but if you take a look at the new movie coming out, Justice League, and I just want to know, I'm just using this for the world building part, there's a picture, or there's a quick flash um, in the la latest trailer, Batman is standing on top of the police station. He's standing on top of a gargoyle that's on the police station now. A gargoyle? It's a gargoyle. Gargoyle. Gar gargoyle. Okay, I can't. <laughs> you guys know I do have problems with speech. Moving on. <laughs> what I'm trying to get with is this, go ahead and say the word. Gargoyle. gargoyle. Thank you. Has a police badge underneath it, and it is... And the 
Gargoyle, Gargoyle is, this is fun. death. Mm-hmm. Oh, cool. If you pause the picture and look at it, what kind of universe is Gotham City in that the police station has death as, as a protector on the police station? And then what does it say with Batman standing on top of death? That also goes into the world building aspects. And with that, I'm going to kick it over to Brad. I'd say that's an average Tuesday in Gotham. <laughs> yeah, <I know. laughs> Gotham is dark. It, it is very really uh, dark. So what I was going to say is um, one of the things that I think is uh, seriously important, we've touched on, is the interconnectivity. And you touched in with what you were talking about in magic, but it also goes beyond that to governments, to schooling, to the way society interacts. It is all interconnected. I mean, if you look at the way the United States works, mm-hmm. which is compared to the way that, you know, France works, or compared to the way that, you know, some. Uh, you know, Middle Eastern country is run or something like that. You know, you compare these systems. But here is my best advice for anyone who wants to build up their world. And it's probably, I mean, it's exactly what I've been doing since like the age of 10 or so. But it's try everything. So if you think a dictator would be cool, see what a dictator would be like. Come up with the system of how you would have a dictator and how they would run the government and all that kind of stuff. If you think that's not cool and you want to create... You know, the utopian society. Well, figure out this, the rules of the utopian society. How are you going to have society that doesn't have money? You know, and if you keep rolling through all of these kinds of questions and you keep coming up with all these different ideas, eventually you're going to lock on to some that you think are pretty cool, like having gnomes run banks underground, that, you know, giant vaults of magical coolness. Yeah. Uh, you know, and you're going to be like, that's a really good idea. I need to put that in a book. And if you keep doing this, you keep running around, you keep trying all these ideas, you're going to run through the bad ones of, you know, like, oh, well, what happened if a dictator did take over the United States of America, you know? Like, these kinds of stories have been done, these kinds of stories have been overdone, Uh, you know, the Nazis taking over, what if the Confederates won the Civil War, all that kind of bad crap. We're going to be able to see that on HBO. Uh, Don't even get me started with that. (laughs) You know, try out all these ideas and then pick the ones you think work the best. And that's probably the best way as to how to build up your own world. See what world you like the most. See what world fits the best. And then, you know, figure out the systems that go along with it and connect them all together. One thing that always, uh, that always interested me when it came to uh, the really good, rich sci-fi universes and everything is their technology. And the really fun thing about that is when you get to t- the technology that doesn't quite work the way that it should. Mm-hmm. Uh, Lucas yeah, had, some have failed. Go George ahead. Lucas had, had a great term, used space. Mm-hmm. And by having everything looking old, rusty, mm-hmm. broken down, it created a real rich universe, and that's a much more interesting universe than if everything was nice and bright and shiny and new. The way that, say, you know, like... Star, say, Trek. Star Trek versus Star Wars. Well, yeah. <laughs> you don't know what side you follow. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. And then I've got one to close off. Go ahead, Fedora. A lot of these things, of course, are, are very important to the story, but I urge everyone to have a core story that is you in mind to link whatever details yeah. and whatever characters yes. you might have floating around and not just create a world for the sake of creating a world, but create a world for the sake of telling your core story. Yeah, I have a great well, world that, that I haven't done anything with because I don't know what the story is. That's right, <laughs> you have to have a core story, I think. Yeah. Yeah. And along with that, you know, we talked about how characters act and give, give their history stories, if you will, in the story. I'm going to throw something else out there. I'm borrowing from Alfred Hitchcock. Okay, before I actually do that, though, I will say, no, I'm not a Freudian when it comes to psychology. I'm more young. But Hitchcock used Sigmund Freud in how he produced his films. And when you have your characters interact with the world, I think it's easiest to use Freud's terms. And that is, what's the character's ego, superego, and id, and its reaction to that world? And, and what is the world's? Ego, super ego, and id. If you don't know what I'm talking about, please look up a little bit on um, Sigmund Freud and to borrow from my psychology teacher who taught me Freud the first time. When I say Freud, you say sex. And with that, (laughs) have a great week writing and tune in next week. We are going to talk about 
the writing techniques of Christopher Nolan. I just double checked that it is what's scheduled for next week. So have a great week writing, Kathleen. And if you want to get the jump on next week's episode, check out the book The Anatomy of Story by John Truby. There you go. Take care, everybody. Have a good one. And thank you for listening. Kathleen, thank you so much. The new theme songs for Right Pack Radio were written and performed by Meredith Tate. All copyrights remain with her.